predominated in history, distrust in government has been a prevailing ideal among its citizens. It has become almost a trend to question the effectiveness of government and highlight its wrongdoing. The government has often taken decisions directly affecting the public without their consent. American distrust is long embedded in time, from Nixon's Watergate scandal to JFK's Bay of Pigs invasion. To the recent tapping of phones, the government has continuously broken the trust of the people, and similar to Maxwell's Law of Solid Ground, as a consequence of this trust being broken, anti-governmental feelings have arisen. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. An excerpt from Ronald Reagan's campaign speech, analysts noted the irony that in announcing the precise government he wanted to head, Reagan hoped to gain presidency and support of the people. Pulitzer winning author Gary Wills offers insight into this phenomenon in his book, a Necessary Evil, A History of American Distrust of Government, examining just as to why people nowadays view government as an evil meant to be curbed. Although this book is filled with a multitude of historical references, it becomes clear that Gary Wills' motivations for writing it was purely politics and to stem the tide falling behind the Republicans' Contract of America program headed by Newt Gingrich, which worked to limit the government's involvement in daily lives. Working to prove the importance of government and its necessity, Wills actively works to prove his point by refuting arguments against government and providing examples that further his conclusion. In addition, Wills works to further his points by referring to governmental and non-governmental values, which he deems to be provincial, com cosmopolitan, amateur, expert, authentic, authoritative, spontaneous, efficient, candid, confidential, homogeneous, articulated, traditional, progressive, populist, elite, organic, mechanical, rights oriented, duties oriented, religious, secular, Voluntary, regulatory, participatory, delegative, rotating labor, and dividing labor. Using this list to complement his examples, Wells works to provide support to his claims, however, does not fully explain how he created the list of values in the first place. Furthermore, appealing to an audience with a broad perspective in history, Wells' approach makes the book somewhat confusing, as he tends to tangent off on minute facts to prove his points, while a lack of explanation to provide support to his examples adds to unclarity despite the effective organization of the book. Arguing that the American distrust of government is not a current opinion, Wills claims that the di American distrust has been weaved into the fabric of American history, articulately suggesting that the distrust of, Amer of government has risen primarily from revolutionary myths which deal with the forming of the nation and government, and constitutional myths, which deals with the constitution. Debugging the frequently held misconceptions on its foundings, Wills suggests that the American distrust is based upon a misinterpretation of history. For example, Will claims that the notion of idealizing the militia and their role in the Revolutionary War as an amateur army always ready to protect its peoples, and the reason for the establishment of the nation is a false assumption. For not only did most of the militia not even own a gun that could work properly, but also it was the Continental Army which won and fought in most of the significant battles. In addition, Will suggests that this anti-governmental attitude has risen in combination to term limits as well. Although opponents argued that government is meant to be inefficient and self-limiting by rotating people out of office, in reality, by enforcing term limits and by rotating officials do we give qualified people the chance to make improvements and bring diversity to the chair. Wills also examines the anti-governmental attitude stemmed from the Constitution. One of the major proponents in his argument 
is that people claimed that the writers of the Constitution hoped to set up a government which would run on its inefficiency. One example used to explain this concept is checks and balances. By making the branches equals, Will suggests that a major source of anti-governmentalism is through the fact that these checks and balances limit the effectiveness of government and states that due to checks and balances, the government is unable to make fast decisions, which in turn encourages dissent by the people. By referencing the anti-federalists and their demands for their balances, Will's works to establish that checks and balances was only a compromise to get the constitution approved and not a measure meant to set each branch equal, but just a fine coordination between the branches. Backing his points by the Federalist Papers, Wills, however, is unable to provide evidence for his interpretation of this compromise, and does not explicitly state the fact that the checks and balances were created to prevent executive tyranny. Furthermore, Wills asserts that this misinterpretation of the creation of the Constitution to create an ineffective government is due to the Jeffersonian ideals of the time, and the lack of an effective authoritative center during the Constitution's creation. The fact that a lack of an authoritative center during the creation of the Constitution, and even during the war, people tended to look upon newly enforced regulation with skepticism, which contributed greatly to an anti-governmental ideal. Also, due to the Jeffersonian belief that a central government would infringe on the rights of the people and stressing the importance of individualism, Wills argues that now, even the slightest governmental interference will be considered an evil. Wills suggests that this invalid opinion is stemmed from the result of a Bill of Rights and the belief that the Constitution purposefully limits the rights of a government, making it subordinate to the states. In addition, Wills also hints that this myth of governmental inefficiency in the Constitution is in direct accordance to the Second Amendment. By declaring the notion that the Second Amendment helps express individualism uncontained with a self-encompassing government, faults. Wills attempts to prove that the ability to bear arms was to protect one's independence and protect against injustice. After refuting such notions, Wills dives into a set of examples to prove his point of the necessity of government. Using examples throughout history, Wills organizes his points into nullifiers, seceders, insurrectionists, vigilantes, withdrawers, and disobeyers. Out of these categories, Wills provides examples for each which refute the opposite view while supporting the good of the government. However, from the entire book, these examples seem to prove to be the most ineffective, as Wills does not warrant his points and also does not explain the ineffectiveness of the methods he refutes, assuming that the reader just agrees with his views. Nonetheless, out of the categories, the most effective to proves to be thorough from withdrawers whom Will uses to prove governance by the government is not necessarily a hindrance. Referring to Thoreau's isolation from government and distancing from authority, Will suggests that dissenters like Thoreau are able to criticize and survive without the government because they had the least impact on it. And although ceding to Thoreau's point that that government is best which governs least, Wills does not fail to mention that government often interferes in the lives of others to protect the general welfare. By proving government is not a necessary evil, but a necessary good, Wills suggests although government might do evil, it is not necessarily harmful to society, and that the government is not meant to be inefficient, but at times led by only ineffective people. In conclusion, Although Wills seems to be appealing to a knowledgeable audience, while often inferring that the audience agrees with his views without giving proper evidence as to why they should, A Necessary Evil, A History of American Distrust of Government offers well-developed revolutionary ideals and highlights an historic struggle of a growing power. As Wills puts it, Our very liberty depends so heavily on distrust of government that government itself, we are constantly told, was constricted to instill that distrust. Therefore, to curb this popular belief, we must actively work to accept the government as a necessary good which protects the general welfare of the people and create a synergistic atmosphere based upon trust instead of questioning the government's ability.